Ladies and gentlemen, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am Mark Bailey, the Chairman of the US Study Centre Board of Directors. On behalf of the United States Study Centre, I would very much like to welcome you all here for this evening's event. It's great to be in Canberra and especially here in Parliament House uh, to be with a, a few old friends and hopefully to make some new ones. Firstly, I want to acknowledge uh, the Nung Nungunnawal and the Gambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of Canberra of the Canberra area and pay respect to all elders past and present. Secondly, I would like to acknowledge our guest speakers, Professor Simon Jackman, CEO of the U United States Study Centre, Dr Charles Edel, Senior Fellow at the USSC, and Dr Jennifer Hunt, lecturer at the National Security College uh, at the ANU here in Canberra and also an alumnus of the US Study Centre. The purpose of this evening's event is to provide an insight into the potential range of outcomes of the upcoming midterm elections in the US and importantly the implications for Australia. Whilst the political events here in Australia over the past couple of months uh, have been interesting to say the least, I don't think there would be too much disagreement with the proposition that they have been overshadowed by the US political environment since the election of President Trump in November 2016. To put that into context, I remember analysis uh, conducted by the Australian media uh, coverage of both the 2016 Australian federal election and the 2016 presidential election of, of Australian media. And apparently that uh, analysis showed that there was twice as much coverage in Australian media of the US election compared to our own election. There's been a lot of commentary in the past decade over high frequency trading in the financial markets. And given the volatility of the US political environment, I think we have moved into an era of high frequency uh, analysis in the political sphere as well. However, the centre, rather than focus on what President Trump tweets, uh, we try and understand and analyse what the administration does. As such, the combined experience and insights of our expert panel will provide an unparalleled perspective on how the midterms are likely to play out and, a, and as a consequence, what the impacts on Australia may be. Some may ask, why does it matter? Well, last year, the Centre produced a report entitled Ind Indispensable Partners, focused on the trade and investment linkages between Australia and the US. Maybe somewhat against the commonly perceived wisdom, it found that the US was Australia's largest destination of foreign investment and Australia's largest uh, source of foreign investment was the US. The two-way investment, uh, in investment trade totaled $1.4 trillion, with more than $800 billion of investment into Australian industry and jobs from the United States. I'd like to summar summarise this by saying that a large part of the reason that Australia is able to trade with other countries is because of the investment capital provided by the US, which, which builds the infrastructure that allows us to export. Together with these investment flows, the trade agreements and security treaties with America significantly underwrite Australia's prosperity and peace. That is why it's so important to understand what is happening in the US, especially at a political level, which determines the US foreign policy. Just some background on the US Study Centre at the University of Sydney. The centre was established by the American Australian Association in joint venture with the University of Sydney in 2006 to provide Australians with a balanced view of the United States and an opportunity to learn and gain insight into what is undoubtedly our most important strategic partnership. It has been fortunate to enjoy the continued financial support of both Commonwealth and New South Wales state governments on a bipartisan basis since its formation, as well as the support of many companies. Its mission has allowed the centre during its 12 years of history to educate over 7,500 students, author more than 1,000 journal articles research reports, opinion pieces and books and convene in excess of a thousand events with tens of, a thou tens of thousands of attendees. As a consequence, I look forward to the centre playing a continuing role at the intersection of the American-Australian relationship and provide a lens through which Australians can view and learn about our closest ally. I would also like to introduce Simon Jackman, who, as I said, is the CEO uh, of the Study Centre and Professor of Political Science at the University of Sydney. Simon has had many career highlights, which are too numerous to mention in total, but significant ones are uh, between 1996 and 2016, he was a professor of political science and statistics at Stanford University. From 2009 to 2016, Simon was the principal investigators, one of the principal investigators 
of the American National Election Studies, the world's longest running and most authoritative survey of political behaviour and attitude, directing this project over both the 2012 and 2016 election cycles in the US. Simon, it's over to you. Mark said I'm a professor, and indeed I am, and um, there will be some slides, um, um, but thank you. Uh, look, this is a great thrill, um, as, as Mark indicated. I look out and I see uh, the ANU row there. Thank you for coming over to this side of the lake, uh, uh, my, my friends from ANU. Great to see you uh, here tonight. And I also see uh, members of parliament. Um, thank you for taking time out uh, from your schedules to be with us tonight. Uh, I've spent enough time up here to know that um, there are many distractions in, in the building on a, on a sitting night, and for you to take some time and be with us, um, thank you thank you for doing so. Um, um, let me get right into it, um, and I'm going to make just a couple of points uh, reasonably quickly. Um, I'm going to talk about really just four things tonight. Um, one is the, um, the state of the um, American economy, um, contrasting that with Donald Trump's approval numbers, um, I'm not going to say much about uh, women candidates in the context of the midterms. I'm going to defer some of that to, to Jen. Um, but I will say a little bit about gerrymandering, uh, something I know um, quite a bit about. Uh, um, and so I will, I'll, I will say a little bit about that and the role it may play uh, in the midterms. Um, and then finally, something I get asked a lot about as the CEO of the US Study Center. So if and when will Donald Trump be impeached? Uh, and so. Um, this room is um, um, a, a little, uh, may I venture, uh, a bit more politically sophisticated than uh, others. Uh, and, uh, and so we won't dwell too much on that. I, I suspect most of you know what the answer to that is. Um, so let's get to the state of the economy. Um, the orange line there shows the performance of the Dow Jones uh, over the last 11 years. Uh, and the white line shows the performance of the all ordinaries. Both of them reach their GFC lows within six days of each other in March of 2009. The recovery in the American market and the Australian markets roughly paralleled one another through to about mid-2010, at which point the American stock market uh, started growing, vastly outpacing performance from um, the ASX by way of a benchmark. And the red vertical line shows the election of Donald Trump at which point the gas pedal went down very hard in US equities markets. So much so that $100 invested in the uh, all odds at the GFC low, if you were able to time that market turn just right, uh, would today be worth uh, on the all odds um, about $200. Well, that same $100, net of any exchange rate movements, by the way, uh, if it was invested in the US, is worth about $400 with most, a big chunk of that growth um, coming, uh, indeed, under the, the uh, last four years of the Obama presidency, but you know, looking for a break in that time series, you know, the, the 2016 election of Donald Trump would, would clearly stand out uh, as a moment uh, uh, where, th where those two series even diverge even further. Um, a question we often get asked about the United States is what about all those um, people that, that were out of work I've got two lines here, again, uh, orange, the highlighted color for the United States, white for the United States. The top line is the labor force participation rate of men between the ages of 25 and 54. Uh, and it's high in both countries, and Australia lags a little bit. It was trending down in the United States, but stabilized. No real movement there that you would associate with Trump uh, and either time series there. Um, but I do want to switch to unemployment rates. And again, a contrast with Australia, just to make it a little bit relevant. Again, the highlighted line, the gold line, shows the American experience. Um, how severe the GFC was in the United States, unemployment reaching 10% at its peak. Um, you see the uptick in unemployment associated with the GFC in Australia, much more uh, muted, that, muted, that blue line. Um, but then, if anything, unemployment in Australia um, uh, went up. Um, over the years 2012 through about 2015 and is, and is on a slow downward trend since. But look at the downward trend in the United States. It's remarkable. The United States is now 3.3% unemployment. Um, the decline in labor market participation has been arrested. 
Um, and we don't know if 3.3% unemployment represents full employment yet in the United States. There's still a bit more give on the labor market participation side. An awful lot of people are working um, in the United States in a way and finding work in a way that was hard for them uh, from the top of the, of the GFC in particular. Um, the other thing is to point to change in real GDP per capita. Again, you can see the depth of the GFC with the United States, but then pretty much from 2012 onwards, the United States, and this is real GDP per capita, that is money in people's pockets, right? Um, the, the American story there um, out, um, outperforms um, the Australian economy um, for, for just about every year uh, from about 2013 onwards, sort of call it a tie in, in 2016. Now, I'm showing you all this economic data, uh, why? Because I want to put it in stark contrast with the other distinctive thing about the United States at the moment, that is the approval rating of the current president. But the American macro economy, at least, is on a tear in a way that I think Australians sometimes forget. Right? But it is, it's on a tear. And some of that is the business community um, getting on, you know, banking on tax cuts that, that Trump actually delivered, Trump and the Republican Congress delivered. If it were any other president presiding over a set of economic conditions like this, the president's approval rating should start with a six or a seven. For Trump, it's lucky to break a four, right? A 41, 42% approval number for Trump is a good day out for him with the polls. And just, we can put it in contrast with the polling performance of, of other presidents. Um, just one little side note, by the way, um, at this stage of their presidencies, Obama and Trump have remarkably similar approval ratings. Uh, it's just that Trump has been there in the, in the 40s all along. Obama sort of tra tracked down in that direction over the first two years of his presidency. Obama went on to be re-elected. George W. Bush has got his um, um, Iraq war, uh, his 9-11 bump rather, and was still um, uh, very high in the polls, um, again, about two years into his presidency. Uh, and uh, was elected to a second term. Bill Clinton did not get off to a flying start either and had a similarly low uh, uh, approval rating uh, by this stage of his presidency, but was re-elected to a second term. George Herbert Walker Bush had the Gulf War bump, but was not elected to a second term with, at this stage of his presidency, uh, a number vastly out, outpacing that for Trump. Reagan, same, same set of approval numbers that Trump has right now. And Jimmy Carter, same set of approval ratings that Trump has right now and did not uh, get re-elected to the presidency. All that is to say uh, is that um, don't assume, right, just because he's got a 40% approval rating at this point of his presidency, he won't be re-elected. Right? Fact one, most American presidents are re-elected when they seek the presidency. Right? If you knew nothing else, you would, that would be the first prediction you would make. Right. Historically, that's what happens, um, uh, more often than not. Secondarily, he, Trump is presiding over a booming economy. Now, will it still be booming two years from now? Um, remains to be seen. But on the other hand, his approval numbers have not left that band of 40. Right? It's been there. People were locked in to what they thought about Trump before he put his hand on the Bible to take the oath of office. Right? And so... It may not, and indeed, one of the things to emerge from this midterm cycle is that as good as the economy is in the United States right now, it is not what people are talking about. That is not what is showing up in research in the polls. It is, it is not the story out there on the stump uh, for, for, for candidates. Um, again, this is a pretty politically sophisticated room, so I, I don't need to do Civics 101 here, but w what's going on right now in the United States? Well, on, the, on November 6th, well, while we're doing Melbourne Cup, actually, it'll be while we're getting over Melbourne Cup hangovers uh, with the, with the, uh, the date line change, um, uh, the results will be coming in from the US. The whole house is up, all four, four 35 seats, as they are every two years. And, and a quirk of the American system, or a, a feature of the American system, is that one third of the Senate is up every two years. They're on staggered six year terms, so one third of the Senate is up. Um, all leading indicators point to the Democrats taking the House. Right? Um, that is right now what we're seeing. I've got a little bit of data on this. This is what a blue wave looks like. Um, the Senate is tricky. Uh, it's less likely to be won by Dems. And part of the reason is, um, again, that six-year cycle. If we're in 2018, 2018 minus six is 2012. What was happening in 2012? A bloke called Barack Obama was seeking re-election of the presidency and had 
insane coattails. Right? Absent the, a candidate like that, now we're in the midterm. There is the presidency is not at stake, and certainly Barack Obama is not on the ballot. Will those states that elected a Democratic senator in 12 revert to type, as it were, and, and bring us back um, a um, 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 Republican senators? And that, that's the current one of the conjectures, one of the leading conjectures about what's likely to happen with the Senate. Again, below the headline, Australians, we don't pay a lot of attention to this from this distance, uh, but state houses are up as well. These are incredibly important. Why? Because in many, many states, uh, who gets control of the state house will control the next round of redistricting. So what's going to happen in the United States is that there will be a census in 2020. If you're elected to a four-year term as governor now, you will be presiding, you will be running your state when that state goes to its next round of redistricting after the census. Right? So in the United States, uh, unlike Australia, um, in many states in the United States, electoral redistributions are partisan affairs. Now, it's an interesting thought experiment for Australians. Imagine the state parliament there on Macquarie Street and one of the many things they got to do was redistrict New South Wales House of Representative seats. Could the, could the government of the day resist the temptation? I dare say not. And indeed, that's not the case in the United States. So these state governorships are important, not just because the states are important, and they are important as, as interesting places where an awful lot of policy happens in the United States, but because of this knock-on effect that they could have with respect to the composition of the Congress going forward. With respect to those Senate uh, House, uh, uh, state house races, uh, gubernatorial contests, there are just two Democratic doubtfuls, but nine Republican doubtfuls. Um, um, that is, that is um, looking slightly better in terms of um, Democratic holds and perhaps Democratic pickups um, than the Senate for the Democrats. Florida will treat, if you're going to watch one thing away from D.C., if you're going to watch one state-level race uh, to show just what an American politics nerd you are um, on November 7, um, the Florida governor's race will be a cracker. The primary contests produced extremists, if you will, uh, from, from their respective parties. A, uh, a conventional career Republican was blown away by, by a Trump-endorsed uh, radical, frankly, uh, insurgent. And, and a similar story happened on the, on the Democratic side where, um, 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 where a Bernie Sanders Democrat won the nomination. And so for the median voter, if you will, someone close to the middle of the political spectrum, the candidates are a long way away. This will make for fascinating politics. The games that get played to win the primary in the American system and then there are a mad rush to the middle um, in time for the, for the general. Um, Florida will, for those of us who pay close attention to the, to the dance, uh, to the art of politics as much as the science, Florida um, will be a fascinating contest. Um, I'm going to skip through this. Time is, is, is running short. Other than the point to... Um, um, the wave of Republican retirements, including the Speaker of the House, um, perhaps not a, a, a great uh, portent um, when, the, when the Speaker decides um, um, he, a relatively young man, um, uh, is, is, uh, is uh, had enough or is looking for a change. Um, and, and the other fact of the matter is that um, by any, any of the rankings of where the toss-up seats are, they are disproportionately ones with Republican incumbents or formerly had a Republican incumbent, the Republican is not contesting, and moreover, they have this, some of them have this particularly interesting status. Clinton beat Trump in the district in 16, but the House member, the House had a personal vote and got themselves elected. Now, you take away the personal vote through a retirement and does, again, similar story as I told you about the Senate, does the, does the, does the district quote-unquote revert to type and, and, and give us you know, vote uh, congressionally more in line with what it revealed uh, to us in its way it voted um, for president in 2016. Um, now we're deep, this is deep nerdery. This is a, this is a, uh, this is a, the red line is, is a regression line. Hello, ANU colleagues. Uh, to, to turn to someone and explain what, no, don't explain to your neighbour, because uh, you're all sitting next to one another, so that won't work. Um, but the, the, the red line shows the line, if you will, of best fit. And what are the best fit of what? Well, on the vertical axis is how many seats are typically lost by the party of the president at the midterm 
And on the horizontal axis is how popular is the president. And surprise, surprise, the more popular the president, the further we go to the right on, on the horizontal axis, the closer we get to zero, zero seat loss, right? And indeed, in a few cases, um, uh, and it's very rare in American politics for this to happen, where the president's party actually gains seats at the midterm. Far more common is the president's party losing seats at the midterm. But when we overlay the fact we've got a president with a 40% approval rating, that puts us somewhere down about here. And I wouldn't take that regression analysis to the bank. Um, it's not based on many data points. Um, but nonetheless, the historical record would suggest um, about a 40-seat loss if the party of the incumbent president, uh, the incumbent president is taking in a, uh, an approval number around about 40%. The Dems only need about 23, about the blue line. And it suggests that if they want to keep the House, Donald Trump needs to find about 10 to 15 points of approval pretty quickly. But as we saw from the early analysis, it's stuck. Right? His approval number has not moved in two years. Another leading indicator is this, and I'll very quickly just explain what this is. This looks at everybody who votes in primary elections in the United States in a midterm and asks, did those people vote in the Democratic primary or the Republican primary? And it's just a simple percentage. Only um, the last time the Democratic share of primary vote was as high as it was, the Democrats took the House back in 2006. Uh, about 57.5% of all primary voters turned out to vote in the Democratic primary this time. Um, it was extraordinarily high. The low point, 2010, the Democrats lost the House. Right, so there's another tracker, if you will, another a leading variable, leading indicator of, of that we're looking at a blue wave, at least with respect to um, the House. Uh, I'll let Jen talk about women candidates. The Study Centre has a really nice piece of research on this really interesting facet of this feature. Uh, it is... It is largely but not exclusively, um, uh, well the gain, in it, it, the gain in women candidates is almost exclusively a democratic phenomenon, um, but it will go down I think as one of the more distinctive features of this electoral cycle and, and I'll, I, won't, I won't stomp on, on Jen's turf with that one. Um, I'll skip over that and just quickly get to a word on gerrymandering. Um, a fly in the ointment is the following. Uh, and that is this I was alluding to earlier that um, re electoral redistributions, as we call them in Australia, uh, redistricting, as it's called in the United States, is a partisan affair in the United States. Now, what that has meant in some um, really big states, important states, that have a lot of congressional uh, districts in them, Republican-controlled state legislatures have drawn their colleagues who sit in the House of Representatives in Washington a very favourable set of districts. So much so that uh, Democrats need to increase their vote share by 13 points before a single seat comes over the line in Ohio. In Wisconsin, Democrats will need 10 per percentage points before they can pull a seat over the line. North Carolina, the number six, in Michigan, five, in Georgia, four. In states in the bottom half of the graph where there are nonpartisan commissions, similar to the Australian model, uh, governing electoral redistributions. The corresponding numbers are two in Arizona, a one percentage point swing in, in California, and, um, and uh, under the new map um, for Pennsylvania that the state Supreme Court there uh, put, put on the books, it's just a one percent swing. Um, Democrats do not have clean hands in this. And by the way, a lot of what we're seeing right now in contemporary American politics is sheer payback. Right, I grew up in Queensland. Um, 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 the, the Nats up there um, uh, were, were simply doing back to the Labor Party what Labor had done to them <laughs> 1930 through 1970, say. Um, and, and right now in North Carolina in particular, you talk to Republicans there, it is the same thing. It's our turn. We got stuffed by this uh, for uh, politically uh, uh, for generations. How do you like it? It, it's, it's, it is payback. But... What it does, it puts a real break on the ability of Democrats to translate that, all those indicators of a blue wave into seats. The analogy I like to use with this is uh, you're at the beach. Where do you put your towel? 
but you don't want it to get hit by the, the surf coming in. So you set it back a little bit. And a whole bunch of you do the same thing, right? You've effectively protected yourself against the wave. That's kind of what gerrymandering does. We'll take a bunch of 56, 44 seats um, and, and we, we pack um, uh, the opposition's votes into um, 85, 15 districts and, and whatnot, uh, 67, 33 seats, uh, where our vote is translating into seats much more efficiently than the other mob, except when that big wave comes. When the big wave comes, all those towels that you've set up at the 57 line, thinking you're safe from 53s and 54s, and you are, right? But when a 57 comes in, and a whole bunch of you have parked there, the seawall breaches, and, and, and a lot is swept away at once, right? So that's, that's the thing to look for. The swing is on, but is it big enough to overcome some of the seawalls that have been built, particularly in states like Ohio and Wisconsin and North Carolina? And that's sort of the... The, the quick and dirty take on, on, on gerrymandering in this cycle. Um, Democrats um, need a big, big swing uh, to pick off those 23 seats because of um, um, very efficient gerrymandering uh, by Republicans, um, helped rather conveniently by the fact that Democrats like to live next to one another. Right? And modern mapping technology makes it very easy to draw districts that look aesthetically fine and a naive judge will say no problem here, but nonetheless have quite uh, pernicious uh, political consequences. Australia really has nothing like this. The closest we have is New South Wales, where conservatives seem to like living on the North Shore, <laughs> bounded by harbour, ocean and Hawkesbury. Right? No, it's, it's true, but, but it's, it's nothing like um, the degree... That's about, a, that's about it in Australia, in, in terms of trying to find where geography... Um, uh, tends to uh, create a, what looks like a gerrymander, um, but but really isn't, and pales in comparison. Uh, not even close. And there's no and there's no malicious partisan intent um, either, uh, um, typically, uh, in, in in Australian redistricting. Um, and that's it from me. Um, um, I want to hand over now to Jen. Uh, as, as Mark said, um, uh, Jen is a, a, a graduate or an alum of the uh, US Study Centre, I should say, um, but, but her PhD is from the University of Sydney. Um, once you hear her accent, you'll understand um, she's what we call in the United States a Tar Heel. Uh, she's from North Carolina, uh, but came to Australia for a PhD, and, and, and thank you for staying. Uh, and is that the ANU? And thank you for sharing uh, some time with us tonight, Jen. Thank you for that introduction, Simon. Uh, yes, I am a North Carolina native. You may hear a y'all. Um, so today I want to talk about three trends that are happening in the, potentially happening in this midterm section. Um, in terms of contenders, state electoral processes, and possibly a higher turnout than we would expect. Uh, as Simon mentioned, this is, a, this is a big race. We have all of the House of Reps up a third of the Senate, 35 gubernatorial races, as well as lots of uh, state-level positions. The U.S. has more democratically elected positions than, per capita than almost any other uh, developed democracy. And sheriffs, judges, right on down to the school board. Um, and just to start with that note on gerrymandering, as a North Carolinian, I've had the privilege of living in uh, one of these extremely gerrymandered districts, both in North Carolina, which was the Republicans, and in Maryland, which was the Democrats. Yep. That's right. So uh, in Maryland, it was pieces of Baltimore from the mountains to the ocean, which constitutes about a six-hour drive if you were to string it all together. And to raise awareness of this, I remember a couple years ago, newspapers showed these districts, uh, and there was a naming competition. This one looks like a dragon. I think this one's a scorpion. Um, in Maryland, they had a, a foot race called the Gerrymander Meander. And it went all over the state, tracking this district, and it took days. So gerrymandering is definitely a problem, and it is one that has been accentuated by this new census that we talked about, which potentially includes a question about citizenship. And that may also uh, change the balance of power. If, if people don't feel that they can answer that question honestly for fear of themselves or their family, that might impact um, districting, um, financial distribution between the states and the like. So, on to contender state electoral processes and turnout. 
Uh, as you may recall, Trump lost the popular vote. Uh, Trump himself has forgotten that many times and likes to say that uh, he would have won it if not for all the illegal voting. Uh, so I think what, what Trump has demonstrated to a lot of people that are now putting them, their hands up for office that experience doesn't matter, right? Um, Trump is the first president the U.S. has ever had that has lacked military, diplomatic, um, or political experience. This was the first public office he's ever held. And so you've really lowered those bars uh, to entry in the minds of many potential contenders. And this has been solidified through some organization, rallies and marches uh, since, since the inauguration. And I'll start with women. So in the long list of year of the newcomer, we have women, millennials, people of color, naturalized citizens running in larger numbers, more veterans. We have intelligence professionals, um, federal bureaucrats, scientists, and medical doctors, a host of them running as Democrats, even career intel, which is um, sort of a novel trend. So the Women's March in D.C., uh, you might know, is the largest single demonstration in U.S. history. Um, 400,000 people in D.C. alone, millions around the country, 408 mar marches in the U.S., 168 in 81 other countries. And throughout this march, you saw people wearing a shirt that said, first we march, tomorrow we run. And a lot of women did just that. So 20,000 women contacted Emily's List, which is sort of a, a training and fundraising center for women seeking political office for the first time. In the first year after Trump, 20,000 women contacted Emily's organization, many of them first-time candidates. And by comparison, in the, in the previous two years, it was roughly 500 women a year. Right? So uh, of those 20,000, roughly half were millennials. Um, and there have been at least, I think still in the contention, 20 millennials running in Congress. Now the average age of the 115th Congress is 58 in the House, 62 in the Senate. This is among one of the oldest Congresses we've had in recent history. And if anyone watched the Senate committee, or was it the Judiciary Committee with Mark Zuckerberg, it showed. Um, when they were asking Facebook uh, how he makes money, uh, and I, I was pretty sure they were going to ask him to fix their printer at the end, <laughs> um, given the sophistication of some of their technical questions. Um, but this is also the first election with more millennials eligible to vote than baby boomers. So baby boomers have held this, um, this mantle, the biggest voting block since 1978. So you have a lot of people not only running, but potentially voting as well. And Trump's job approval rating among millennials is 27%, right? Significantly lower than other generations. Um, this is because millennials differ on a lot of the, the policy prescriptions of the Trump administration on immigrants, climate change, the economy. When you pointed to that 2010 uh, you know, Nader, that was right when a lot of sort of the early millennials were entering the job market. Um, I myself am a millennial, so I don't want to use that for shorthand for just young youngins, right? Um, high school or college kids. And um, but you do see a galvanization of this youth vote. You had high school and college walkouts after the 2016 election all over the country, um, citing hit Trump statements about Mexican immigrants, women, minorities, Republicans, and Democrats. You had uh, the Parkland shooting in Florida, which really galvanized youth around this gun control issue. And you had those same students uh, hosting a March for Our Life campaign and a national bus tour registering people to vote all over the country. And I saw a very interesting PSA uh, recently, which I've tweeted, trying to galvanize a youth vote based on these different generational perspectives on policy. And it was, dear young people, don't vote. You know, climate change, that's a you problem. Right, and um, I can't keep track of which lives matter, right? So it was, uh, it was quite an interesting PSA. Um, and I think it really points to trying to galvanize that youth vote. For midterms, we normally expect around 25, 30% possibly for midterms in that youth vote, but I, I fully expect you're gonna see more in this particular round. In terms of running for office, you have not only women, people of color, but also scientists and doctors. And this is pretty unusual. Uh, doctors are one of the two professions that is exempt from jury duty in the United States, right, along with lawyers. 
large because they know too much, <laughs> and uh, doctors because they're too important to society. We need them doing their function. And I think with the Affordable Care Act and some of those health care debates in the United States that you've been seeing, a lot of doctors and scientists and researchers are saying, actually, it's more important that I am part of a decision-making body because you see a real anti-science move happening in some quarters of the Republican Party. Um, similar marches along these lines, right? We had the March for Science, I think in April of 2017. And then you had the Trump administration leaving the Paris Agreement. Uh, you had the confirmation of Scott Pruitt as the head of the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, a man who is the Attorney General of, uh, of was it Oklahoma? Uh, sued the EPA 11 times and, and lost every time. And you also see the Trump administration withdrawing federal funding for cancer research and FEMA um, to pay for immigrant detention. So in issues of health care, cybersecurity, stem cell, you see a lot of researchers, doctors, scientists, really taking up the mantle and, uh, and, and, and actually putting themselves out there for office. And they have their own organization, sort of similar to Emily's list. It's called 314 Pi, right? Because <laughs> nerds, right? So, um, and, and sort of the last trend on that is former intel professionals and veterans running as Democrats. You see an unusual number of former intelligence professionals running as Democrats. And on interviews, they have listed Trump's disdain for the intelligence community as their impetus to run. Um, he said that the intelligence community was acting like Nazis. He talked about himself in front of the CIA memorial wall. Um, he has refused to fully embrace the conclusion that Russia interfered in the 2016 election. And you might recall that um, a former CIA officer, Evan McMullen, actually ran as an independent, former Republican, um, during 2016 to try to give a, an alternative to the Trump conservative vote at that time uh, in Utah. And he had a great quote about why this is happening. And he said, well, these are the professionals that have seen the destructive tactics of corrupt power-seeking demagogues overseas. And they correctly see the same threat in our president and the rise of polarizing extremist movements in the United States. So what could possibly be standing in the way of some of these great, diverse candidates that are probably more represented than a Congress than we've had in a very long time? And as we mentioned, uh, gerrymandering, which is a long-standing tactic, it's at least 100 years old. But we have some new tactics that we're employing as of late. And that's because key portions of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 were dismantled by a Supreme Court decision in 2013. So the 2016 election was actually the first one that we've had as a presidential election without those protections of the Voting Rights Act. And the main protection was that if states sought to make changes in their electoral processes, that it had to go through preclearance first. There was some vetting. Um, every process about voting is down to the state level, what the ballots look like, where the polling stations are, um, how many days you have to vote early or not at all, whether you have mail-in ballots or not at all. And we saw some of these, um, these early tactics happening in the first midterms. So for instance, in North Carolina, which is sort of famous for examples of political science of what not to do, um, North Carolina commissioned research on voting practices. How do people in our state vote? But they, they wanted the results by race, specifically by race. Uh, and then when this case made it up to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court said that, that with surgical precision, they eliminated the processes that African Americans used. Early voting, same day registration, Sunday voting. Um, and the GOP actually sent out a press release celebrating the decline in early voting by African Americans, African Americans in 2016. I remember when, when I was at home, um, the, poll, the, the county next to mine in 2012 had 16 polling places. And then in 2016, it had one, right? So if you can imagine the queues, the lines. And I remember voting day is happening on a weekday, on a Tuesday, right? Uh, in winter, weather might be nice. You might be outside in the line for three hours. And since that date is hard and fast in the U.S. Constitution, it's not liable to be changed. And of course, it has to be on Tuesday because you needed time for people to go to church on Sunday and then a day for travel. So that's why it's in a Tuesday. And, and, and it's a work day, so employers have to give you the time off, but you don't have to be paid for that day necessarily, especially if you're an hourly worker. So standing in, in the queue for four hours might not have been available to a lot of people. Um, voter ID laws are also part of these new initiatives. 33 states now have voter ID laws. 
Um, and a 2017 uh, study found that the adoption of voter ID laws is most likely when control of the governor's office and state legislature switches to Republicans and when the size of black and Latina populations in the state increases. Um, so this is seen as a way to, um, to limit, especially the youth vote or the rural vote. States have also experimented with purging the rolls. So you may have seen some recent headlines about Georgia purging voter rolls if registration uh, names didn't match exactly, if a hyphen was different for whatever database they held. Um, the Supreme Court ruled in, in June that Ohio can purge voters from its role when they fail to vote even a single time. Um, and so this is what, what happens when we don't have these safeguards of the Voting Rights Act in effect anymore. Um, so it means that when you have these unusual positions, like in, in Georgia, you have the Secretary of State who is the official in charge of elections in that state actually running for governor. So he's running for governor in an election that he is officially overseen. Um, some of these tactics become a little bit more sinister, the purging the voters. Georgia also has another problem that it's one of five states that doesn't have paper ballots, which cybersecurity people scream about up and down all the time. You know, we, they would prefer that we did all elections on paper when I talk to cybersecurity um, experts about election security. So there's no backup, there's no paper trail if the, if the, if the computers goes down, if the, if the software goes down. And that's another one of those decisions that's down to the state. Um, so in conclusion, I think we've got a very interesting field of contenders. It's much more diverse than we've had in recent memory. We've got some obstacles to them getting elected, some of them historic, but some of them some new tactics. But I, I do think you're going to see a bit more of, of a turnout in midterms that we're expected to see. You have a lot of people that have been galvanized by the election of Trump. A lot of people who haven't felt heard, were frustrated by the result, and have, and have learned by example that they too are qualified for office. Thank you. Um, you want to come to the lecture? Fantastic, Charlie. Because yeah. Charlie's a professor too. Uh, Charles Adele is um, uh, is visiting uh, the United States Study Center. Um, uh, Charles, an interesting character. Um, 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 Ch Charles um, worked uh, in the State Department in policy and planning uh, under S Secretary uh, Kerry. Um, but as a PhD historian and, and teaches at the Naval War College, um, um, when he's not um, with us in Australia. Um, it's, it's been so terrific to have um, a scholar of Charlie's caliber with us um, at, at a US study center. Um, not just Australians, or those of us with US citizenship, or not looking back at the United States, but, 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 but to have Charlie's perspective as well. He's very much in demand down here in Canberra, talking to um, many, many different parts of the Australian government. Um, as he was just earlier this afternoon. Um, but, but what I asked Charlie to do was to step away from election prognostication and, and some of the sort of insights we've been giving on, on US domestic and, and give us, so what does it mean for Australia? And what does it mean for US foreign policy? Um, uh, the election and, and what might come after the election. So that's the brief, Charlie. You're on. Thank you for being with us tonight. Thanks. Well, we know Simon doesn't do politics because you're supposed to lower the bar. So you can judge what you think when you listen. Um, so a couple of uh, different things. First of all, just thank you all uh, for coming out and listening to this. Thanks to the staff for uh, setting up and thanks for those really interesting uh, presentations. And now I'll talk about nothing that was in there. Uh, now, look, for a long time uh, since I came out here, I've been out here for about a year. I only got one question and it came in about 500 different varieties. And it's, hey mate, uh, we just want to know, is this a crazy one-off or should we expect more of this? And of course, it's important to point out, my answer is always, it was a crazy one-off. If you think about the truly unique circumstances of that 2016 election, 16 GOP candidates running, uh, you had a polarizing candidate on the Democratic side, and of course, you had Russian intervention into the processes. They were a very unique set of circumstances. But if you think that this came out of nowhere, that's a misnomer. It's not the correct way to understand what's been happening. And you can actually look, of course, 
across the world because it's not unique to America seeing a wave of populist candidates, even if Trump is unique, and that's certainly the most diplomatic way that we can possibly couch it. Um, so this brings us, of course, because it's in America, it has global ramifications to this election. And what I thought uh, might be interesting here is to not, again, look at the elections, but to look at what some of those implications, what those ramifications might be. Now, some of you probably remember Don Rumsfeld's famous, infamous comment that there are known knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. Uh, I don't think that's exactly this election cycle, but it's close to it. And instead, what I'd like to do, because this is how I think about it, is there are a couple of things going to happen in American foreign policy that will happen regardless of electoral outcome. And you can actually see some of those coming already. And there are a couple of things that are wholly dependent on what happens in those races that were just being talked about. So let me break those down each of those. Uh, ladder first. So a couple of things I think are going to happen regardless of what happens in the electoral outcomes, regardless of who takes this as uh, validation or rebuke. And I think there are three big muscle movements you can see coming. Uh, the first is much more focus on China. Uh, the second one is more resources coming from the US federal government in the short term, particularly to this region of the world, on the Indo-Pacific region. And then the third one is somewhat counterintuitively uh, from the media that you watch, public opinion, which of course has an effect, although one that's always hard to trace on political effect, seems to be moving on foreign policy matters in the opposite direction of President Trump towards supporting a rules-based order. So let me talk about each of those. Uh, so first, October 4th, Vice President Mike Pence gave a speech at the Hudson Institute where he outlined and articulated the challenge that China presents to American national interests. And he ticked through these in a very broad fashion, everything from unfair trading practices, which includes the theft of IP, forced technology transfer, uh, subsidies from state-owned enterprises, and of course, economic coercion applied to states that don't comply with how China wants it to be seen. He underscored the increasing threat to the US and United States allies militarily, and the Chinese desire to push the United States out of the Western Pacific. He underscored as well, the increasing turn by the Chinese Communist Party towards control and oppression at home, and the export of some of those practices abroad. He highlighted, uh, additionally, it was a long speech, uh, he highlighted also the increasing oppression for religious and ethnic minorities uh, in China, including, and he detailed this publicly because we've now seen this start to break onto the front page of the New York Times, the detention, torture, and forcible re-education of up to one million Uyghurs in Western China. And of course, he highlighted too, public interference in the debate and discussions in the United States and amongst its allies. And the point of that speech, and there have been many critiques made of it as well, is that across the executive branch, which includes all the departments and all the agencies of the US government, there's an increasing focus on the challenge that China poses to the United States. This is not Trump specific, this is bipartisan, and you can begin to see the machinery of government, which has had a very slow start under this administration, gearing up for a more coordinated approach, particularly on this animating how it moves forward. Second change that I think you see coming. Uh, the Congress, partially in response to Chinese activities, partially in response to Trump activities, and concern about what Trump thinks about the rules-based order, has begun to pony up, not the cash, but more cash to reassuring friends and allies, particularly in this region. And there are a whole bunch of data points you can click through for this. Uh, you recently saw the pass of the DOD defense budget at $716 billion, which is 2.28% up from last year. Uh, you just saw $60 billion uh, backed by Congress to finance and capitalize development programs across Southeast Asia that is explicitly to compete with China's Belt and Road Initiative. And the one that has not yet passed, watch for this one too, is the Asia uh, 
I'm going to screw the acronym up, but the Asia Reassurance Initiative, uh, which was reported out of committee unanimously, both Dems and Republicans, and if it actually passes, in addition to that DOD defense budget, will be another $7.5 billion for defense, state, and aid agencies in this region. So again, this says nothing about structural long-term economic challenges, but in the short term, I think the demand signal from Congress has been seen around the region. They're pointing up more cash, and I think that's going to continue. Uh, third one, public opinion. Uh, now, of course, public opinion doesn't matter at all for foreign policy until it does, <laughs> right? And so it sets, of course, the broad contours of what all three branches of government uh, can and often do do. And so what's been really interesting is that despite the loudest megaphone or the loudest Twitter box in the world, with Trump constantly going after or questioning, we should say, in a more diplomatic term, the value of alliances, the value of free trade, the efficacy of promoting democracy and human rights, you are actually seeing American public opinion moving somewhat consistently in the opposite direction. And the most recent data points that came out on this uh, was two weeks ago by the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. It's probably one of the most authoritative polls. And again, it substantiated that there's movement in the opposite direction. And that's even more true when you begin to look at Asia. Uh, so in terms of American support uh, for allies and partners in the region, for the last six years, it's consistently been moving up. It's now two thirds of Americans support this. In terms of the TPP, or now the CPTPP, uh, despite Trump's uh, withdrawing from the TPP, on the third day of his presidency, there's now a majority of Americans, 61%, that thinks that America needs to join this. So you're seeing some interesting trends emerging from this one. Okay, uh, that's where I think those things are going to continue regardless of what happens. Now there are a lot of things that can only take place that we can only answer once we know the outcome. Now both Jen and Simon and I were very generous, were very diplomatic, saying that they don't know exactly which way the election is going to go. You're not sure exactly where those beach blankets are going to line up when the wave comes over them. I'm not nearly so shy. I'm going to tell you exactly what's going to happen in the election. <coughs> the Republicans will win the House and the Senate. Or the Democrats are going to win the House and the Senate. Or the Dems are going to win the Senate and the Republicans are going to win the House or vice versa. That is to say there's one of four outcomes, uh, and it's going to be one of those. Uh, but of course, which one it is will affect the conduct of foreign policy a little bit, and it will differentiate between those. So I thought what would be interesting would be to give you where I think foreign policy will go under each one of those scenarios briefly, and then we can tackle those maybe a little bit more in depth during Q&A. So if you have that scenario of Republicans retaining, retaining control of the House and Senate, uh, I think all of you know what you will get in foreign policy. More of the same, a more trumped up version of Trump with less constraints placed on him. Now it is true, it would be very hard for the Democrats to take the Senate as Simon has laid out, but that's the nuance of the debate. This will be seen as a validation and so you are more likely, someone disagrees with me and they're calling in to say so. <laughs> it's okay, sorry to call you out on that. Uh, but I think really what you're going to see is more Trump uh, feeling his inner Trump. You'll see a realignment of the cabinet. Uh, I know many people are questioning Mattis, but it's not only Mattis. You'll see the uh, attorney general potentially up. You'll see uh, commerce at some point up. There will be realignments and they will be more Trump-like. You will also see, if it's possible, even less resistance from the GOP in the House and Senate to the White House, because it will be seen as a validation of Trump. So that's one scenario. Uh, flip it, totally different scenario. The, the Dems take not only the House, but also, miracle of miracles, take the Senate. What will happen then? Um, I think two things in broad stroke uh, we can say are likely to happen. One, a return of divided government. Uh, now Simon talked about this kind of in the, I'm a historian, I'm not a political scientist, I didn't understand the quadrants, but it looked really <laughs> smart. Um, <laughs> What I think you're likely to uh, see is Americans traditionally, traditionally, like divided government. We designed our federal constitution to not be able to do too many things. And in midterm elections, this is what Simon was alluding to, 
you oftentimes see the president's party lose power because they don't look so good after two years of governing. Now, I know there's some anomalous factors that we pointed to with the economy, but if you see that happen, what you're likely to see is divided government, which means that Congress will return to its role of actually overseeing, providing an oversight role over the executive branch, which means many more hearings, many more investigations, uh, and a lot more people testifying up on the Hill. That means secretaries, assistant secretaries, deputy assistant secretaries, uh, investigations that actually have been shut down in the House on Intelligence Committee will be revived. And you don't have to take my word for this, Adam Schiff, who is the minority um, chair of the House Intelligence Committee, wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post last week where he said, if we retake control, here's what we're going to do to exercise our oversight. And basically, as far as I could tell, he sent it around to every other Democratic member of Congress and they put their wish list in. He said, but first things first, that investigation on the Russians. So that's one point. The other thing that I think you'll see is a debate that the Dems took it, but what were the Dems for other than being against Trump? And that matters, of course, when we begin to look forward to the 2020 election. So I think you're going to see a debate within the Democratic Party, actually in some ways regardless of who wins, about what a Democratic foreign policy will look like. I tend to think, and this is where I, uh, I, I beg to defer, that Bernie Sanders actually seems to be norming and in some ways leading the pack on foreign policy. He gave a really interesting address uh, at Seiss Johns Hopkins. It's a big uh, university and institution in Washington, D.C. And what he said, which I actually begin to see when I look at, because we're not going to have 16 Democratic candidates, but there are more than 10 that are putting their hats in the ring already for 2020. What Bernie Sanders said is I think the broad contours of where you see the Democrats going which is a more anti-authoritarian, more pro-human rights foreign policy. And I got to say, like 90% of that is simply in opposition to Trump, not because they feel it in their gut. But that's where I think the Democrats are going on foreign policy. Uh, one more thing, though, on that, if the Dems do take, if the Repu let me say it this way, if the Republicans take a drubbing, there might be, might, I underscore might, some soul searching within the GOP about how closely they want to be aligned with Trump moving into 2020. Historically, you get primary challenges to a sitting president, rare, but it does happen when they are seen to be electorally vulnerable. When if you align yourself too closely, it means nothing good for these members' chances. So if the Dems retake, I think you'll begin to see more rumblings of a potential challenge, potential, uh, to Trump and if that happens, it will occur along the more traditional Republican foreign policy, pro-trade, pro-strong military, pro-human rights and democracy. Uh, final one, what happens if one party takes one, the other goes the other? Uh, I actually think for the most part it will be a watered down version of that second scenario. Everyone will claim victory in some ways, uh, but the two things that will happen under that scenario are what I laid out at the beginning. You're going to see more focus on China, you're going to see more resources forthcoming in the short term, and that's simply because it's the only thing that they can agree on at this point. Uh, but we can talk about any of that further during Q&A. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> as dynamite, thanks, Charlie, as delivered, as, as spec'd. Uh, um, Drew has a microphone. Uh, and we've got a little bit of time for Q&A, and I'm, I'm sorry we haven't left more, but that's what happens when three professors get up at the lectern. But uh, with a room like this, I'm dying for some of you guys and gals uh, to, to lob some questions here. Put up your hand, and Drew can bring you the microphone. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be greedy, two questions. One, the GDP per capita distribution, uh, the you numbers you put up there, how, do they, how does the distribution look? I mean, yeah, GDP's up per, per capita, but who's got that GDP? Yeah, yeah, no, good. Yeah. Second question, I've got a question to you, sir. The National Security Statement that was released in December 2017, uh, you, you clarified this beautifully, but is, is this to be understood as the culmination of, uh, of processes that have been going on inside Washington for years and not a document of the administration? And should we, you know, and... How, is that that sort of 
that statement would stand if we saw a dem in the White House, I think. Okay, yeah. Who should go first? We'll, we'll start with Tim. Um, it should be understood as a statement of this administration. It's on the law that you have to produce these. They never say when you have to produce these. Uh, but the Trump administration gets high marks for completing its homework assignment early. Uh, it did it within the first year, actually within the first right, 10 months or so of the administration. That is unusual. It is wholly a product of this administration, full stop. However, the question behind your question, I think, is does that reflect broader thinking? And the answer is yes, yeah. on several scores. Uh, one, it is not just those sitting and scribbling in the White House who did this. It is a product, to a certain degree, it's lowest common denominator, it's government, it's an interagency process, right? Uh, but the broader concerns, particularly because this was a rather pointed document, as was the national defense strategy that came after the fact. These are representative, I think, of certainly the national security community. And I would say that while there's differentiation about whether or not the utility of such pointed words can have effect, particularly, uh, well, for different reasons on China and on Russia, a more competitive geopolitical atmosphere, the one that we are dealing in, that is a bipartisan across Washington consensus, I would say, at this point. Gini coefficient continues to trend down. More people finding work, though, so it, it's interesting. The rich are continue to get richer, but the really interesting thing, and I need to look at the data, is how that stabilisation in checking out of the labour market, right, and coupled with lower unemployment, um, surely, right, has to be putting dollars in the pockets of people who have been, who've been doing worse off than, than they are right now. And the question is, how many of those people are there and, and how politically consequential is that, not just for these midterms, but I think more importantly, perhaps for 2020. Um, Drew, you're directing traffic. Thank you. Yes, yeah. thanks. We heard a bit about democratic mobilisation, um, but over the last month we've probably read a fair bit about Republican mobilisation, particularly post-Kavanaugh nomination. Uh, and what we read today about the march of uh, people seeking asylum through Mexico, which I is probably, uh, while it has a two sides to it, it can mobilise democratic votes, given their degree of mobilisation, it probably has a greater impact on the mobilisation of Republicans. Um, how important is that with the assumptions going into, particularly the state gubernatorial races in the House, given the Senate is more stable, given the geographic spread of mobilisation is now more separated, arguably, than at most times in US history where you might have Democrats and Republicans living next door to each other more often than you do now. Jen, do you want to sure, take a swing? Thanks. My mic I mean, I'm an American. I shouldn't need a microphone. Um, so I would start with the first part of that question, which is how mobilized are the Republicans? And traditionally, very mobilized. Um, this thing we have in political science that uh, in order to vote, Democrats have to fall in love. Republicans just fall in line. Um, and they've been a very, you know, a stalwart, um, uh, you know, group, right, to show up at the polls, especially during midterm. But what you're seeing is a lot of people very discouraged by Trump's behavior and his rhetoric, particularly women. Um, and it's all that's necessary for them to sit this one out, not necessarily even vote Democrat, but just not show up, right? Not, not all countries are so blessed to have compulsory voting, just sausage sizzles. Um, so I think that rhetoric has really impacted his approval rating in a way that isn't necessarily reflected in some of the statistics, partly because you see people who are no longer identifying as Republicans, right? So that pool of people that they're polling who you identify as Republicans is going down um, by people who have left the party. And in terms of these recent crises on the border, um, I think Trump is, is counting on these sort of crises to galvanize support and get people to, to the polls. Um, a lot of Republican voters told me, because I'm, I'm descended from a long line of Trump supporters, um, that they wanted these Supreme Court appointments, right? So this was very important to them. So if they consider that they've already gotten that, perhaps they're, they're less motivated um, for this midterm and, and the upcoming. Drew's choice. <laughs> Thank you, Drew. Something that affects Australia quite a lot uh, is uh, what Trump is doing to global trade. Um, but from what I understand is that 
people, um, both left and right, uh, in the United States are often quite anti-free trade. So do you see any light at the end of the tunnel on free trade and also the rules-based uh, trading system? Sure. So that's a tricky one uh, because <laughs> it's true that globalization has not benefited everyone equally. That was the first question we got here today. Uh, but again, it's a question of particular policy because when you ask Americans, are you for or against free trade, actually the numbers are poor and going up. Uh, I mentioned this earlier during the talk, 61% of Americans want America to join a seed to a comprehensive CPTPP. It was TPP, now it's CPTPP. Um, so in free trade, Americans want it, but of course there are great challenges because the cane has been distributed unevenly. So in terms of where are we going with this, uh, you know, there's one school right now that says, well, what does Trump actually want from China? Mm. Can you tell us? Because we see tariffs escalating with no end in sight. There's another school of thought that sees this as when China acceded to the WTO in 2001, it made a set of commitments because it was a developing economy and to play by the rules. It is not a developing economy anymore. It is about to oversee, overtake the US as the most robust economy in the world, one, and it still doesn't play by the rules. That is actually a sentiment that is felt on the left and on the right, from finance, from manufacture, on every third Tuesday by Silicon Valley. They're kind of all over the place on these things. And so I think the end in sight here is one of two eventualities, but we're not there yet, which is trying to right size what a fair system looks like when someone says they'll play by the rules and then does play by the rules, or we move into an entirely different economic future where you begin to see decoupling of the United States economy and the Chinese economy. Um, real quickly on this, um, more, um, there's more bipartisanship um, on, on being tough with respect to China, but I, I think one thing, a democratic controlled house, given the amount of energy on the left that will be there, and, and by the way, look out Speaker Pelosi, like, like does she survive? Uh, or is it just so much energy from this, in, you know, presumably insurgent new millennial members of, uh, of Congress, veterans of uh, Occupy and, and all sorts of lives mattering and whatnot, right? Will, will that Democratic majority in the House, um, although they're prepared to, on behalf of American workers, be tough with China, will they, on behalf of American workers, want to get into um, CPTPP? That I'm far less sure about. Um, um, and I, it's one of the, and, and for the same matter, are they willing to sign off on the defence budgets that I think Australia, frankly, and, and those of us invested in the US-Australia relationship would like to see? Um, I think that those are some real, um, real hard questions uh, to, come, to come out of uh, the election. Time for one more, Drew tells me. Um, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks so much for the presentation. So two quick questions. The first one was, you talked about divided government, the kind of the, you know, the most likely scenario that we have coming up. Um, are there any prospect, like, prospective areas of legislation that there might be some unity and we might see? Um, a lot of times, I think one of the ones mentioned recently was pharmaceuticals and things like that that might trump the unity in President Trump and the Democrats in the House. The second more esoteric question was, um, close followers of the kind of the upcoming election, I found it really interesting. There were a couple of um, Republican governors in heavily blue states that are doing really, really well, especially when the Senate race is in those. Um, and that's, I think, Maryland and Massachusetts with Governor Schaefer and Logan. And compared to kind of the congressional candidates are running very close with Donald Trump in terms of their campaign, I would wondering if you have any insights of how those, you know, in this kind of hyper polarized area, how those moderate governors, Republican governors, have been able to do so well. Well, wow. a question like that reminds me of the United States Study Center is 25 people <laughs> surrounded by 25 million experts on the United States. Uh, <laughs> right, that's, that's, that's all. Chart, do you want to have, a, do you have a, a, a crack at that? Sure, I'll, I'll take the first one, but not the uh, second one. Uh, look, the, um, the joke, uh, one of the jokes that goes around Washington is uh, that next week is going to be infrastructure week. <laughs> yeah. 
because the White House has a plan on infrastructure, and it's coming any day now. Uh, and kind of the punchline behind the joke for those five of you who did not laugh with us uh, <laughs> was that when Trump came into office, this was a bipartisan demand signal that the United States vastly needs to upgrade its own infrastructure. And had Trump decided to put that one out, he would have put, in one sense, the Democrats in a bind. But he hasn't done that because we've never had that infrastructure plan roll out. So look, on the one hand, are there a couple of bipartisan low-hanging fruit uh, infrastructure, yeah. yes. Um, are they likely to pursue it, particularly if you have a divided House, potentially Senate, that is considering impeachment hearings, that is certainly moving forward with uh, investigations? Unlikely. I, I'm more bullish on infrastructure. I think it's one of the few things that um, uh, Dems and the and the House uh, Dems in the House, presumably they win, uh, and Trump. Uh, the problem will be Republicans in the Senate. Mitch McConnell saying, well, we can't afford it because we did a trillion dollars over 10 years in tax cuts, never mind that. Um, little sting in the t uh, flip, flip on that, though, is that, um, you know, Ambassador Hockey, my God, if he's talking about anything in D.C., it's the, it's the, it's the wisdom of asset recycling and triple Ps. And, but there's a serious point here, right? When the Prime Minister, then Turnbull, and the Premiers, were, that was the trade mission, selling... Australian policy expertise with respect to infrastructure, selling Australian um, pension funds and selling Australian management of big infrastructure. It was, it was a, the centre went along, we had a small role to play with that, with that trip. Um, um, Australia, by the way, and your super fund would re should really hope that this gets up, right? Because mm -hmm. um, um, it is going to be largely, given that the public purse is rather done at the moment in the US and, and defence and other things are probably ahead of, on the queue, the way that infrastructure is palatable in the political environment and the economic environment, fiscal environment in the United States right now, is a greater embrace of exactly what Joe Hockey is running around telling anybody that will listen to him about is the way to fund these things. Um, and so um, 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 go, go long on Transurb and, and Lend Lease. And, uh, <laughs> But, but uh, I'm not a licensed uh, to issue financial <laughs> advice is the necessary disclaimer. Um, um, my bantering is what stands between us and a drink, um, so I will cease. Uh, but thank you so much uh, for coming along. Um, great to see you out here um, for this event tonight and, and to see so much interest uh, in, in U.S. politics. Um, that's what the Centre's in business to, uh, uh, to, to help educate Australians uh, about. Uh, great to help for you to help us fulfill that mission tonight.